And welcome to another edition of the Surge Armando the Monster Medina, along with my tag team partners. As always, it is the Hall of Fame coach, Tony Daba, El Autobus, Christian Molina. Gentlemen, it has been a while, and I'm telling you, it has been a minute since we've been here. Uh, I like to blame uh, high school football, Utah football, everything, all the traveling that we've done, and all the good stuff, but gentlemen, <laughs> at the end of the day, we are back. We are here. So, Coach, we'll start off with you, brother. How do you feel today? Oh, I feel great. It's a uh, bowl season coming up. I mean, it, things couldn't get any any brighter than that. Boost, how about you, brother? You got a big trip to uh, make in a couple of days. Actually, tomorrow, I believe. Well, what day is today? Today is Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. right? So, Wednesday. yeah, you've got a big trip to make in a couple of days to Albuquerque. Excited about the New Mexico Bowl. So, how you feel today, brother? Good. Excited. Just doing the, the finishing touches on all the uh, prep and, and things of that nature. Getting ready to get all the facts and clip notes and getting ready to make that trip uh, Friday afternoon and, and get settled in for that New Mexico Bowl Saturday. I'm pretty excited right now. And we're all excited as well. Ace will be going with you as well. And uh, we've got the preview up right now on epsportsnetwork.com. So check it out. Witnessing history, a heartfelt place to make the drive and join the Aggies and all that good stuff. So Christian's got the article right now at epsportsnetwork.com. Well, gentlemen, the UTEP Miners have a brand new football coach. He is Scotty Walden. And, um, you know, he's a fired up guy. I'm, we're going to play a clip here in a couple of seconds. But first, your overall thoughts when you heard about it. And Christian, we'll begin with you. Yeah, he was on the uh, list uh, as uh, reporters got closer and closer. He was on that finalist list. And I thought he was an interesting uh, hire and then started to do some interesting research on him and, and saw how energetic he was, how he was touted as one of the, the better coaches around uh, under 35. I think he was on that list and uh, how his offense gets off the ground, you know, wants to get a playoff every 12 seconds. So I thought it was a the thing that they were looking for a young, energetic, offensive mind to compete with all the teams in Conference USA that have really good offenses and stout defenses. Been looking at all the hires he's bringing with him. It's a very exciting hire for UTEP, and uh, I like what he might be able to bring to that program in a couple of years. Coach, your thoughts on the new head coach, Scotty Walden, for the UTEP Miners football program? Well, I, I, it, as a uh... Christian said, I like his enthusiasm. Uh, he's young. He, he understands how to win, uh, although it's not at the same level. But, you know, th those things can be uh, can be changed. Uh, I like how he, he brings his staff over so he's familiar with, uh, uh, with all those coaches. But I think what impressed me the most, guys, is uh, uh, what he's done in the last few days in talking to the players from El Paso. Yeah, and, uh, yep. It, it, it's just, it, I've you know I, I was really surprised because in all the years I've been here, you know when I was at Franklin, they uh, the, the staff came down. It was never the head coach, uh, but uh, the staff would come down. And I, I think talk to me about maybe three players at Franklin back then in in those times, and and now you know you could see he he they studied film, they they know what they're looking for. And I, I think it's a great start, and, and it's, it's great for the community as well, being able to, to, to understand that uh, uh, it, it'll be the hometown boys that are going to be out there on that field. Well, let's hear from the brand-new coach of the UTEP Miners, Scotty Walden. This is from the press conference from last week. A chip on my shoulder, edge type guy. I've been counted out many times, and that's what I love about this place. We're the quote-unquote forgotten ones, but they're going to remember us pretty quick. I can tell you that right now because we're going to outwork, we're going to outplay, we're going to outcoach, we're going to outrecruit our competition, and we're going to build this thing with integrity, and we're going to build this thing with the most dynamic staff in the country, and it's going to be the funnest product you've ever seen in UTEP history to watch. It's going to be an aggressive style of football. On offense, we snap the ball every 12 seconds and we fly. We don't wait on anybody. If I go forward on fourth down, all right, guess what? Hey, we don't get boomy. All right, we get it. Cheer loud. All right, let's go. All right, because we are going, we are going to, we are going to electrify the sun ball. We want this place right here, which I, I made a statement on this and I stand by it. This stadium right here, this is the best group of five stadium in the country. And the, with the most, yeah, you give it up on that. Give it up. When I look at all the potential here, um, I, I see a place that is ready to be woken up. And I'm not a man of guarantees. I'm not one of these guys that gets up here and says, I guarantee you we're going to win this, win that, all that stuff. I, the one guarantee I'm, I make to you is there is not going to be a staff that's going to work harder in the country to get this thing right both on and off the field, do, doing, doing great things in the community, doing great things in the classroom. We are going to be committed 
to our process, committed to making this place a winner and committed to building leaders in our program. To our players that are currently in the locker room, hey, give me a chance, don't leave. All right, don't leave. This, this number, I don't know why you'd want to leave this place. Recruits, I don't know why you wouldn't want to come play at this place in El Paso, Texas. With the most passionate fans, that place right there, I've seen, I've seen that place packed out. This place has pride and tradition um, unlike any other, and we're going to bring that back, and we're going to fight to bring that back every single day. Uh, we're going to develop men of character in our program. This is going to be more than just a football program. I know I'm touching on the football side right now, but this is going to be more than just a football program. You know, we got a saying in our program, how you do something is how you do everything. And we want to be one with the community. We want to support the sports that are on campus. Our volleyball team is playing tonight. Our basketball teams who are competing. We want to be advocates for the university and join forces because we broke it down on family when we started this thing, right? And unity is the secret in everything that we do. Unity is going to be the secret. X's and O's is going to be great, but it's going to be the El Paso community. It's going to be the community of UTEP coming together as one and for a common goal. And I'm so excited to partner that. We're going to get out in the community. We're going to be visible. All right? I, I, you know, I'm proud of uh, you know, bringing two of the four uh, conference championships to Austin Peay State University. That's all great. But one th the thing I'm probably most proud of this past year in, in winning a conference title, our guys put in over 700 hours of community service okay, in, a, in a fall semester. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. We are going to develop young men that have a heart to serve and a heart to be a part of the El Paso community because we have to go earn your ticket in that Sun Bowl, and we want to give you a product to be proud of on and off the field. I want you to be able to call your friend that's that, you know, they're cheering for the Aggies, they're cheering for the Red Red, cheering for all these people, and you with pride get on that phone and have a conversation with them. Hey, I'm a UTEP minor. I'm at the University of Texas at El Paso. And this is going to be one of the most up-and-coming programs in the country, in the state of Texas, and we're going to do it with you. And, we, and I want to be clear, we're going to recruit the city of El Paso. We're going to find the best players. That's right. We're going to find the best players in the city of El Paso, and if they walk out of El Paso, all right, like, that, that, that's not okay. All right, that's not okay. It's not going to be okay with my staff. All right, I'm a firm believer you have to own your region in recruiting. You have to own your home base in recruiting. So it starts here. We will be committed to making sure that the best group of five K okay, football players do not leave the city of El Paso. And then we're going to branch out into the Texas high schools. Yes, we're going to utilize the transfer portal. Yes, we're going to utilize junior college. But you build your program with great high school football players, especially from the state of Texas. We go back to that T and UTEP. This is the state of Texas. And we're going to be advocates. Uh, we're going to make sure that THSCA, we're going to make sure that the state of Texas doesn't forget about us out here in El Paso out west. And there you have the uh, words of Scotty Walden, the brand new head coach of the UTEP Miners. Coach, if that doesn't get you fired up, I don't know what will, you know? Yeah. Oh, definitely so. Definitely so. And no, not just, I mean, he's talking to the public and in, in making that, that first speech. But, you know, there, there's a lot of other individuals that are listening to that. You know, uh, st uh, players that are still here. Uh, players that are that he's going to recruit you know a, a lot of things that he, he he makes a lot of sense and you know he sounds really honest and you know sometimes you think you know i think well you know he's he's not old enough he, he may not have the experience but you know what that enthusiasm that in in, in my eyes sometimes it beats experience because the experience you can gather you know the enthusiasm sometimes is hard to come by and, and Christian, you look at the situation. He's 34 years old, and uh, as he talked about earlier in his in his speech, that he's been in the he like jumped from different school to different school. So I think he can relate to some of these kids. But the miners have lost a couple of the big names, like Deion Hankins is gone. I think a lot of them, most of their offensive stars have left to the transfer portal. There's nothing wrong with that. But still, what do you think so far uh, from what you heard from Coach Walden? I mean, to be very honest, this is the first time that I feel. Like, there is some hope for UTEP. Uh, like, this guy is doing what we've talked about in the past. And we've sat here and said that, why aren't they recruiting in the backyard? Why are these kids leaving? Why did Jeremiah Cooper, uh, who's lighting it up at Iowa State, why did he have to go out the door? Uh, you know, why did uh, uh, L.J. Martin have to go yeah. out the door? Uh, a lot of talent is around this city, and it's always been sort of uh, sad to see other schools that are hundreds of miles away 
jumping in off of them first. And that's always been something, even though I cover NMSU, you know, for, for EP Sports Network, but watching UTEP, you know, I grew up going to UTEP games with my dad and my uncle, and it was always uh, a fun, exciting time when the stadium was full and when Boise State would come to town, when Texas would come to town, and they would give them a really good game under Coach Price back in the day. And we haven't seen any of that since. And I think there's so much talent now in the city and him talking about they got to recruit here. That excites me. That that lets me know that these kids, you know, instead of having to tag UTEP football and tag the coaches constantly, hey, look at what I'm doing, they're going to be noticed. And that's going to be great for them because a lot of these kids grow up being UTEP fans and they want to play for UTEP. You know, they it, need to play for UTEP. Yep. And as Coach talked about it this week, they've already been through many of the schools, visiting with the schools, or something that's I don't think it's been done in a very, very long time. But the yeah. one thing I love the most, gentlemen, about what he said in that clip is that, and we'll see if it's true, every 12 seconds the ball is going to be snapped. That means it's going to be a no-huddle, fast-tempo type of offense. And we'll see because it's something like that that we haven't seen here in the, for the UTEP Miners uh, in a very, very long time. So we got a lot of uh, time to talk about Coach Walden. Let's talk about some of the big news that we had here in the city of El Paso. Of course, the biggest game of the year it happens here. It's the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. Notre Dame versus Oregon State. Oh, my Lord. Our good friend <laughs> Bernie Olivas was so happy when this was announced that he, my man, was crying. Of course, we had him and we're during one of our half times and yeah. kind of like talked about Notre Dame, but really wasn't like realistic. But all of a sudden, and at the end of the day, it landed here. We got a great matchup. It's 19 versus 16. Uh, Coach, your early thoughts about this game. We got a lot of time to talk about this game. We got next week, the week after. Right. But for your first impressions about this game. I, I think it's a great matchup. And, you know, it really is. Of course, you know, nowadays with, uh, with players opting out, I mean, you know, that's just something that you really can't control. You know, but I, I think it would be great if uh, uh, the rules hadn't changed and we had this matchup with everybody coming into play. <laughs> I think that that, that that would be something extra special. Uh, it's not that way anymore, but nonetheless, it, you know, it's still the name. It's still two quality teams. You know, the, there are still players on both sides that have gone you know, through the whole season, and it's still going to be an interesting matchup. Boost your thoughts on the some the Tony the Tiger Sumble. As you you're gonna be working it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's gonna be fun. I am excited to work for CBS Sports again. So that's that's gonna be fun. But uh realistically, you know, that day when you know it was taking forever to announce that teams, people kept saying people forgot about Notre Dame, didn't they? Yeah. And that's what ended up happening is people forgot about Notre Dame and then they had the drawing and they came here, and that's the luck of the Irish coming to the Sun Bowl. I think it's gonna be a good matchup. I'd say about you look at all the people opting out, it's still going to be about 95% of starters playing on both sides. So, I mean, that that's going to be great. It's going to be a good matchup. Two top uh, teams that are ranked in the top 25. We haven't had that in a minute. And we haven't had Notre Dame since 2010. And you obviously saw it with the ticket prices surging up uh, the very next day. So, if that doesn't tell you how good of a matchup this is, I don't know what will, but I'm very excited to be there. As you talked about it, it's sold out. And let me just say, for people talking about how like the quarterback is not going to play for Notre Dame, all that stuff, Oregon State, we'll see who doesn't play. At the end of the day here, the some bowl, I mean, the, the, the hardcore sports fan is going to show up no matter what sure. here in El Paso. They show up to UTEP football games, the basketball games, the volleyball. Uh, and we'll speak about the volleyball team in a couple of seconds as well. Quite tremendous uh, job they did. Uh, but when it comes to the Tony the Tiger symbol and Notre Dame and Oregon, the common El Paso sports fan, they don't know who the quarterback is. They're going for the uniform. They're going for that gold helmet, and also Oregon State's pretty good as well. So, you know, I think it's a slam dunk. It's a home run for the uh, Sumbo Association. Congratulations to them. So I look forward to that happening. So um, let's talk about the UTEP Miners women's volleyball team. Of course, they got into the championship game uh, last night. So unfortunately, Wichita State beat them in straight sets but still it was a tremendous accomplishment for them to go this far and once again uh, coach ben wallace doing a tremendous job boost your job your your uh, thoughts on the tremendous job by uh, the utah volleyball team this year you know they sold out those last couple of games and that just tells you this city is craving success at, at the college level and the fans showed up and the volleyball team did an, an excellent job you know sometimes some teams go to tournaments and they kind of bounce out one round, two rounds, and they're, they're nowhere to be found. But UTEP, you got to give credit to Ben Wallace uh, as a coach. He, he's gotten 
so many good players here and he's developed them. Some of them weren't very heavily recruited and he's turned them tremendously into some talent and he found the gel, right, that, that brought him all the way to the title game. And so it just shows you the mix of this this city craving some really good, uh, you know, teams. And it doesn't matter the sport, you know, UTEP having those sellouts and people asking him to put them in the Don Haskins. That's how excited people were. And you have to take your cap to Ben Wallace, who's been here such a short time and has already turned them into success. The future for volleyball here uh, is on track to be one of the better programs in Conference USA. So you got to be excited for what they are laying down as a foundation right now. Coach, your thoughts on the UTEP yeah. volleyball success? Yeah, Coach Wallace, I mean, you have to give him a ton of credit for, for the thing that he's done and, and, and developed this team. And, you know, I mean, you look at three straight sellouts at the end of the year. You know, that old saying, uh, if you win, they will come. Well, yeah, that, that showed up. I was watching yeah. the game uh, last night, and I mean, it was wild. Uh, all the three games that, that were sold out here uh, were just wild. They, they, they didn't uh, uh, play last night uh, as much as well as they played in the previous two games, but nonetheless, uh, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for for getting up that high. And, and like Christian said, you know, this I, I think this is only the beginning for this program. You know, Coach Wallace is going to continue to build on it, and it's just going to get better. And gentlemen, I think that when people talk about that they wanted the Haskins Center, well, there's a couple of reasons why it didn't happen. One, uh, the first one, the main one is because they're getting the floor ready for graduation. You know, so because graduation is this week for the U10 minors, so they got to take all that the uh, the the floor for the basketball. They got to take that out. And then the other reason why is because I, I think. The capacity is like 3,200. It makes a more intense atmosphere because it's smaller and it's louder. Believe me, I've, I've been there when it's sold out. It is just so loud. It creates a tremendous atmosphere. Uh, but at the end of the day, Wichita State was very powerful, true to their nature. They only lost one set in the entire tournament, which is very impressive. But still, the U10 Miners volleyball team was very impressive. Once again, con congratulations to Coach Ben Wallace and the tremendous job that they did. Well, the Greater El Paso so football showcase all-star game is this Saturday and I know uh, what's well, going to showcase a lot of the uh, football players here in the Sun City. Uh, Christian, you and Ace won't be there because you're in Albuquerque but Coach, you will be there so give us your thoughts sure. on this big game that's going to happen at the SAC. Well, you know, it's one of those annual games that pretty much closes the career for a lot of these players. You know, this is the last time they'll be able to put on a uniform. And, you know, it's always very competitive. And, uh, you know, you look up and down the rosters. Uh, it's very interesting uh, for each team. Uh, you know, you, you've got uh, the two quarterbacks for, for the Blue Thunder. Uh, one of them is Evan Minhadis, who, by the way, congratulations. He committed to uh, to West Point uh, the other day. Uh, and so that, that's where he's going to go. And, and then uh, also you have... Uh, I'm looking for the other name here, Michael Southern, the other quarterback. So that, that's the Blue Thunder uh, quarterbacks. For the Red, you have Gael Ochoa, you have uh, Shea Smith, and then uh, plus you have Mark Moore is in there also. He's the punter, but uh, I'm sure that the coaches will find a way to, to get him involved it, because again that that's the nature of the competition uh, for this game you know the running backs uh you've got max uh, mancia uh there are quite a few running backs you got in for the wide receiver you had diego oaxaca uh you had Jude blanco uh you have chris davis i mean i'm, I'm really looking forward to w what they can do they can showcase themselves on saturday and I just have to add that it's going to be kind of hard not to put Mark Bourne in the game eventually because he won the uh, quarterback challenge <laughs> <He> on <laughs> Saturday. So uh, still, boost. it's a tremendous opportunity for these kids to play one last game, and it just so means a lot yeah. for them to be able to play in this game. Yeah, and, and, you know, as Coach mentioned, it's the last time, but for some of them it's the last audition. You know, they, they do a great job of getting some college coaches down here and some scouts to, you know, look at them on, on Friday and look at them on Saturday and – some of those kids walk away with an offer. So it's it's a last effort to extend your life uh, playing this game uh, in, in a collegiate career, potentially. It's also the last two raw for a lot of those guys who who know that, you know, they might be a little too undersized at the lineman position. So this is the last time they'll play and they'll come out guns ablaze. And I'm sure when they, they put Mark Moore back to punt, you can anticipate them <laughs> punting. You have to anticipate a fake, right? Like there's just no way Mark Moore's going out there to punt. Yeah, uh, something has to be brewing. So it should be a fun matchup. And uh, you know, me and Coach talked about it earlier in the year. There was just so many talented seniors this year that it was wow. going to be hard 
to kind of fit them all on the field. So I know that was an e- that was not an easy task, but it should be fun nonetheless. It, it always is. And I can tell you th- uh, that the committee had a hard time finding uh, the, all the quarterbacks to fill because there's so yep. many good quarterbacks this yes. year. So that's uh, uh, yep. a situation there. So uh, we wish them nothing but luck. It's happening this Saturday at the Sun Bowl. Before we talk NFL, I do have to talk about mm-hmm. some breaking – NBA news that just came across my phone is that Draymond Green from the Golden State Warriors is suspended (laughs) indefinitely until he meets with the league for and they got to meet with him. So, of course, we know the situation where he choked out one of the Phoenix. Actually, he punched up with up. He choked out one of the players a couple of weeks ago suspended. Yes, Rudy Gobert. And then so this was barely a six game back. And then all of a sudden, big old swing punch. And then I think the biggest problem is that. Uh, I guess the, the Phoenix Suns player, though, I think the biggest problem is that how he kind of acts like, oh, well, you know, like I didn't mean to do that, but I think we kind of yeah. think that he did. So it's more his reputation. I think he's been uh, ejected from a game 18 times already, but of course, this was a big swing, you know, and a punch and he connected. So it just looks bad for the league. Boost, we'll get your thoughts on the situation there with the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's funny when Steph Curry doesn't play, Draymond Green gets ejected. And ever since Draymond Green got his big contract, he's been ejected more. Uh, my man has gotten his money and gotten a little lazy, um, in my opinion, and he's gotten reckless. He's gotten careless, and he does not want to put that full effort in because he knows that he has to put in more. Clay Thompson isn't the Clay Thompson of old. Steph Curry doesn't play as many games. And so when they try to lean on him, he says, well, I'm going to choke somebody. I'm going to punch somebody. I'm going to roll on somebody. I'm going to get ejected and I'm going to go clock out. It's just not a good look. And I'm sure the league wants to get with him on it because it's it, somebody put a pattern on Twitter that I think 16 games that Seth Curry has uh, sat out, he's gotten ejected before the halftime in all of those games. So that's, yep. that's kind of a red flag. Yeah, they, they got to change that because one, it's not good for the league. It doesn't, doesn't look good. And, you know, obviously he's just, he, it kind of seems like he doesn't care. You know, of course he knows that he's got an announcing career afterwards if he wants to. He's dabbled in that. He got a podcast career if he wants to. So he's pretty set afterwards, but still uh, just sending the wrong message to the youth, especially in the NBA. And they can't have that. Coach, your thoughts on the situation? Yeah, exactly. That that's that that's my main point. Is uh, you know he's uh, you know people are looking up to him. You know, there's kids that want to play like him, and you know showing his I don't know whatever you want to call it brashness or you know and, and maybe he thinks he can get away with it or you know skip a couple of games and so forth. But but I think you know it all started earlier this year where when they when the Warriors gave him that new contract. You know, and why would they do that? I mean, in his mind, he's thinking, well, you know, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I've, I've got my money. So, you know, I really, really don't have uh, uh, much to, you know, a- any more of an incentive, I should say. And, and you know, th- this just looks bad for, for a steep curve, for, for just a warrior organization. You know, if you can't control them, you know, why does the league have to control them? You know, that should be something that the team has to do. And then the funny thing is that when he takes ownership of it, it's almost like he, he kind of he's forced to take ownership of it. It's sure. almost like when he apologizes, he really doesn't mean it. So uh, uh, he doesn't mean it. So we'll see uh, how this progresses. So that just broke as we were talking a couple of seconds ago. Uh, let's talk a little NFL news very quickly. A couple of things I do want to talk about, of course. The big game be, be said be between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills there situation where the uh, wide receiver was offsides and of course one of the most epic plays you're ever going to see there and I, on top of my head i'm forgetting his name you know the wide receiver uh for uh, uh, yes tony Jadarius yes, tony. Jadarius tony who was offsides clearly offsides mm-hmm. those are uh, mahomes to kelsey kelsey throws back to to tony he scores a touchdown but at the end of the day you see the replay he was outside, but I think the bigger thing is how Mahomes responded. So, yeah. and coach, I honestly think that Mahomes was responding that way, not just because of that game, but because of the game before where they should have thrown a, a pass interference. So I think he was just frustration, but your thoughts on all that, how that, all that played out. Yeah. And I think to me, that was the puzzling part is, is Mahomes reaction. You know, I mean, uh, to me, it was extreme. <laughs> there's, there's no reason to, you know, to yell and scream and curse and you know do all the things that he did. I mean, the uh, the officials threw a flag. 
because there was a penalty. I mean, it's simple as that. You know, I mean, the argument about you have to have a warning first. You know, I think Richard Sherman uh, said it best. He said, "Well, you know what? On defense, they don't give you a warning uh, before you know <laughs> if, if you're across a line of scrimmage before you, they actually throw the flag." So, I mean, to me, that's ridiculous. I, I think Mahomes is just frustrated. It's not the year that he expected. You know, his receivers are just dropping balls left and right. Uh, you know, he's trying to go to Kelsey. Kelsey's double team, triple team. You know, it's 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 a tough situation, and so I think it's just showing his frustration. It's not the right way to do it, though. That's that's what bothers me. And Christian, I saw a video from uh, ESPN's Dan Orlovsky who will put together a clip that every time he was out there, he was basically offsides. Like he was offsides yeah. like maybe four times, and they didn't call it then. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Patrick Mahomes showing us that he is a little bit human, uh, but still at the end of the day, I'm very curious to see. Do you think he's going to get fined? No, I I don't think you can find the golden boy. I just don't. I don't remember the last time Tom Brady was was fined for talking about the officials. I just don't think that that happens when you know they're trying to use Kansas City as the face of the NFL right now. They're they're trying to use the whole Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey thing to their advantage. I, I don't think that they'll find him. Uh, I, I thought it was overboard. He couldn't even congratulate Josh Allen properly without complaining about it. Um, I also saw a video from the sideline when. Yeah. Darius Tony, he's looking at the ref, but he looks at the ref for like maybe half a second, doesn't yeah. even check with the ref yeah, early. No. So that's on him. And I, I think right now Kansas City's really missing Tyreek Hill. And think, this, uh, yeah. They, they didn't want to pay him. And, and yeah. now I yep. think it might have been worth, you know, fronting the bill, kicking the can down the road, whatever you have to do with the salary cap in order to keep him. Because I'm sure wish he would have him right now instead of Kadarius Tony, who's not only messed up in this game, but it's messed up in a, a bunch of other games dropping the passes, being out of bounds. I'm surely uh, they, they might be regretting that trade uh, as it hasn't yielded the way they expected it to. Well, eventually they had to pay people. They have to pay Patrick Mahomes, and that means you can't afford the other people. So, uh, But still, I, you know, you, you brought up the whole situation. We were sitting talking to Josh Allen. I guarantee you Josh Allen didn't care at all about <laughs> no. that when they was complaining because they won the football no. game because for once – the uh, Mahomes magic did not work. And it's like yeah. this year, normally everything goes their way, and this year it's not going. But, hey, it's still very – long as they get into the playoffs, which they will, then we'll see the magic. So uh, uh, there's still a lot of uh, history to be written for the Kansas City Chiefs for um, uh, this uh, season. The other thing I just want to quickly – your thoughts – Who's the best team in the National Football League right now? I'll tell you right now, for me, I think that the best team in the National Football League is, without a doubt, is the San Francisco 49ers. And I say that because people will talk about uh, Dallas, Philadelphia, maybe Baltimore, you know, on the other side. Because right now, I think this is one of the years that the NFC is more dominant than the AFC teams. There's not really a big dominant AFC team. So look at... Uh, Baltimore needed a, a, a walk-off, a punt return in overtime to win that game against the Rams. And we've seen when the Rams have played the 49ers, Cowboys, uh, they've just been destroyed. Uh, so that's why. But the 49ers, to me, I say that they're the best team in the league because I think they're the team that it doesn't matter where the game happens, they're going to dominate. And ever since they went through that three-game through, through losing streak, they've been a different team. They look like the team that destroyed the Cowboys, of course. They uh, destroyed the Eagles as well, and they won their last couple of – the last game as well. So, Coach, for you, who, who's your most dominant team in the National Football League right now? Well, uh, I agree. It's, it's the 49ers. I mean, you look at uh, uh, their offensive uh, uh, output and, and then their, their defensive skill players. You know, it's just – you know, in, in the NFL, on any given day, anyone can beat anyone. But you, you look, you look at you know what happened through the whole season up until this point, and compare the uh, uh, the style of play and the uh, uh, everything that the 49ers have done offensively and defensively. And to me, I think they they're head and shoulders above everyone else. And until somebody actually beats them, I mean, it, and it's going to happen in the playoffs. And right, right now, the way it looks, they're going to be playing at home. So they're going to have the advantage going in, and they're going to be tough to beat, I believe. You know, the only crazy thing, Christian, is the fact that when you look at Philadelphia and Dallas, that situation there, that if Philadelphia wins out, uh, even if they have the same record with the Cowboys, they still win the NFC East. That means the Cowboys are going to travel, but still. Uh, that game on Christmas Day is going to be very interesting, Baltimore versus San Francisco, but still. Uh, Moose, who do you think is the best team in the NFL? Yeah, I would have to say it's the 49ers just because they've they've beaten all those teams in the NFC that are that are, I think are the next best teams. It's the Cowboys and the, the Eagles. I think those are the top three teams in the NFL and they've handled them 
uh, easily. So I, I think it's the AFC right now is so weak. Um, you know, Kansas City is only one game ahead of the Broncos, who are seven and six. And then you have <laughs> seems like everybody and their mother in the AFC is seven and six. And this weekend, you're going to see a lot of breaks that way. So I think the AFC is so weak. And anybody can really win it, but you talk about the NFC. It, it's a it's a race between those three teams. It's the 49ers that are above everybody, and then it's the Cowboys and Eagles, and whoever has to go over there has to come up with some kind of magic, and you know you know cast a spell over the stadium and try to come up with a win. It's just not going to take more than it's going to take more than a perfect game. Whoever has to go into that stadium and try to come up with a win, I think right now it's the 49ers, and that game come Christmas time. I don't know if it'll have any implications for San Francisco. I think it'll have more implications for the Ravens. So I, I think at that point, there might be some downplay for the 49ers because they might have some things locked up already, and they might be comfortable because uh, the other well, teams are going to have to beat each other up. Well, I, I think that they're, they're going to have to – I think they're going to have to win out. I think the Cowboys need to win out, and I think Philadelphia needs to win out because Philadelphia has an easy record, easy schedule coming up. I think the toughest team they're going to play, so honest, play honestly, this Sunday against Seattle. Other than that, I think it's the Giants twice, and then uh, the Commanders. The Cowboys, they're the ones that got the, the hardest road. You got Miami, you got Buffalo, Miami, Detroit, and then uh, the Commanders. So, But the 49ers, I think, as long as they win out, they, they get to be the number one seed, and I think that's going to be important. So, I'm going to ask you uh, two quick questions, and I just need yes or no uh, answers from you very quickly. And the first one is, is Bill Belichick going to return with the New England Patriots? There have been rumblings today that uh, maybe his time is done. Coach, what do you say? No. Boos. No. Boos. You know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> yeah. Mike Tomlin, is he coming back with the Pittsburgh Steelers? Your, yes or no? Yes. Coach, yes, I say yes as well. There's no reason to get rid of a uh, coach, Mike we'll Tomlin. Never take him out. We'll, never uh, take him out. well, you know what? I, you know, and I know I said this quickly, but the only reason I would say Belichick, and we'll talk about that more next week, is the, the whole handling of the uh, Tom Brady situation. So, but we'll talk about that more next week. So, now let's talk about the big bowl game happening this Saturday, of course. That is the Isleta uh, New Mexico Bowl. Is that what they're calling it, Christian? The, yes, the Isleta uh, New Mexico Bowl. It is the New Mexico State Aggies taking on the Fresno State Bulldogs. Of course, the Fresno State Bulldogs were there two years ago, and but they're taking on the UTEP Miners. And now let's see if uh, New Mexico State can go out there and win this game and win two bowl games in a row. First time historic. And the one difference is that when New Mexico goes to the bowl games, they, they win their games, you know, and unlike the, the UTEP Miners. Uh, but at the end of the day, we wish them nothing but luck. So, Christian, take it away, my man. Give us a little preview of the bowl game. And, of course, you've got the article up right now at dpsportsnetwork.com. But still, give us your thoughts on this tremendous game. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Uh, the, the line right now, I think, is at 61 points. I don't think it's going to be a high-scoring affair. I think this game is going to be relying on the defense. Fresno State has to come out and, and stop the Aggies' uh, rushing attack, who's averaging you know just around six yards per carry. They have to stop Diego Pavia, who is going to play, uh, who is questionable at some point, but has done some tremendous rehab. And so he looks like he's closer to 100%, not exactly 100%, but having him back there is going to change the dynamic of him being healthy. Uh, Eli Stowers is coming back after not playing that much against Liberty. I think they were careful with him. He had concussion symptoms. Uh, and so having them at full strength will be a go because Trent Hudson, who was the leading wide receiver for New Mexico State, had 10 touchdowns. Uh, receiving uh, will not be there. He'll be in the transfer portal, and that was probably the biggest loss for New Mexico State. They do lose, uh, I believe, Acres, and they lose uh, – I'm losing the track of the other cornerback, but they lose two of their guys that rotated in the secondary, which does not help New Mexico State because Fresno State loves to air it out. Uh, New Mexico State struggled against the passing attack of most teams. I think uh, FIU was the only – uh, worst team as far as uh, defense through the air in Conference USA. So New Mexico State has to put pressure on the offensive line and disrupt the flow because Fresno State is going to want to go uh, for a lot of uh, air yards. They like to get around 400. They haven't done that. Last four games, Fresno State, they've been outgained 175 yards in each game, dropping uh, the last four. And remember, this team was flirting with a New Year's, uh, New Year's Six Bowl. They were 8-1. and one. They looked like they were going to be on top of the Mountain West. They would have been the best team at that point 
to go to a big bowl. Instead, you have Liberty going to play Oregon. So this team is on the downward spike. They're not going to have their head uh, head coach there, unfortunately, due to health issues in his second go around with Fresno State. So it's going to be an interesting matchup. I think it's going to be low scoring. When you look at the transfer portal, New Mexico State's lost eight players to the portal. Fresno State has lost six. Uh, but significantly, though, Fresno State has lost three guys that have started defensively, two guys that have started offensively. So they're losing a little bit more there. I think this game sits somewhere 27-24. Uh, I think that it's pretty evenly matched up. And it's a good thing for NMSU to play Mountain West teams because for so long, NMSU has tried to get into the Mountain West. The Mountain West has kind of stiff-armed them and said, uh, no ducks, we don't watch it. And so, you know, New Mexico State has something to prove. Coach Jerry Kill was not a finalist for Coach of the Year. Okay, he was not one of the 12, and he should have been after the two years that he's had. So I think Coach Kill has a little bit on his back to kind of throw some oomph on national TV come Saturday. How is he not one of the 12 for the Coach of the Year with that job? Of just the, just the, the job that he did with them beating Auburn should have given it to him right then and there. Uh, yeah. Coach, your your thoughts on the New Mexico Bowl. And, but, but, Boosh, you didn't tell me who's going to win, brother. But we'll get back to that. We're going to get <laughs> no. back to that. You didn't tell me who's going to win that game, but we're going to get back to that. Uh, Coach, your, your thoughts of the tremendous compliments of the New Mexico State Aggies. Yeah, the, you know, I, I, I look forward to watching that game, look forward to uh, uh, New Mexico State, uh, you know, coming out on top again. You know, one of the things that Christian mentioned, uh, you know, the Aggies are, it, although they lost against Liberty uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mean, they, they still had a, had a great season. Uh, on the other side, you're looking at Fresno State who comes in losing their last four games and they've lost their head coach. That's not quite the situation you want to go into, into a bowl game with, especially with the, uh, the players going into the portal. So, you know, I think that would be a little bit, uh, as far as Fresno State, you know, they're coming a little bit as underdogs coming into the game. And I, I, I just hope uh, both teams actually show up. You know, it's one of the early bowls. Uh, in early in the bowl season, and you know sometimes they they can be one of those games where you know you don't really you don't really know what's going to happen uh, until you actually get on the field. So, but I am looking forward to to that game. It's going to be interesting. And the one thing you talked about that both of you talked about that lost Liberty and and gentlemen, I'll just tell you this right now: Liberty is for real. That team is oh, for yeah. real, you know. And of yeah. course, they're playing the Fiesta Bowl, so you know they're they're for real if they're going to be playing in the Fiesta Bowl. So. Uh, now another question, by the way, I think uh, New Mexico State is going to win and they're yeah. going to make history and two bowl games in a row, tremendous accomplishments. So that's going to lead me. By the way, Boos, who's going to win this game? Yeah, New Mexico State, All right, they're there you chasing go. history. They're chasing there you history. Go. There you go. The 60s, All right. man. All right. All right. There you go. I just want to make sure because you didn't give me a prediction at the beginning. So <laughs> now let's just say everything goes on New Mexico State's way and they yeah. win this ball game. And uh, great representation, not only here of the Southwest, but also Conference USA. So now let's talk. About that, you talked about how some of the players moved uh, transfer portal that's happening every single year now. So now let's talk about Jerry Kill, his situation there. I know there, I know there's a lot of uh, a boost. I think you said that Boise State might be interested in him, things of that nature. So, uh, do you think he comes back after this, after Saturday? Is he still going to be the head coach of the Mexico State Aggies next year? You know, he says all the right things in his conferences that he's put it in the hands of the administration. He's laid out what he would like to see happen. I think it'd be very hard to get him away from here. I, the general like feeling when you're around him is that he loves Las Cruces, that he loves that he wants to retire here. Remember, he's faced some health issues. He's a little bit older. You know, he's 62. I don't know if he's got another one where he can go and jumpstart another program because this one has sort of exhausted him a little bit. You know, he wasn't around at practices for Hawaii. You know, there were some times where he was not available to the media. So I I think this has taken a toll on him and he has to be delicate with it. And I think the administration is going to find the funds and find the stipulations. Remember, some of the stipulations, Mondo and Coach, it's not about money. It's about fixing a dirt parking lot. It's about putting a new air conditioning system in. It's about fixing the scoreboard. He didn't put money as all the stipulations. Yeah, it's, it's, the facil- it's the facilities that yeah, they need to fix. The upgrades. And, and, I, and I think they'll find the money with the ticket sales and the bold money and the Auburn money, the $2.75 million that Auburn has to write that check for. They will find some of that money. And if you look deeper into the finances, they're going to come out of the red that they've been in for some time, paying some contracts off. They're going to come out of the red here eventually, and they'll be able to invest And I think uh, Coach Kill survived this hiring go around, this carousel, and I think uh, they'll find ways to attach him to more money in the future. 
And uh, what what grade is Pava? Is he a senior or is he a son? No, he's got one more year. No, he's got one So if he comes back, Coach, he'll come back and they're going to run this again. That That's right. how I look the, at it. The, the biggest yeah. thing right now, though, is the NIL with Pavia. A lot of people have said that some schools might throw a good chunk of change at them, but the portal closes in less than a month. So if they can find a way to harness it, NMSU does have their own NIL collective. So if they can find a way to harness all the excitement around it and find a way to keep that pair together, I think they'll come back next year. So, uh, well, so uh, we look forward to that. And uh, like I said, Coach, did you want to say something about Jerry Crow coming back? Yeah, I, I'm just, I, I think uh, Christian made a great point about, uh, you know, going to another program uh at his age and and the, in his stage of his career th that would be kind of tough but you know w what i worry about is some of his assistants he has some great assistants oh, yeah. you know that defensive coordinator to me <laughs> you know I, I heard him one of the football things he, he's really impressive and he's young mm -hmm. so you know, that, that might be something that to me that would be more worrisome than, than actually coach kill leaving yeah, there's two guys that I kind of worry about is uh, Nate yeah. Drelling, who's the defensive yep. coordinator, like you mentioned, and Tyler Wright, the tight ends coach, mm -hmm. offensive uh, coordinator assistant. Those two guys were tabbed as one of the best young coaches around in, in mm -hmm. that article that uh, Coach Walden was mentioned in as well. I'm kind of worried that after this year, maybe one more year, he's going to lose yeah. some of those young guys and he's going to have to scramble to kind of replace, especially Drelling. As a defensive yeah. coordinator, they've gotten so much better in the two years, that's that's going to be a tough loss when it comes around. Well, gentlemen, we look forward to the game that's going to take place on Saturday. Of course, you and Ace mm -hmm. will be there. So we have the videos, the pictures, all that stuff, the recap. I know you have more stuff coming up uh, as well uh, leading to the game there. So uh, first of all, Christian, have a safe drive up there. Yes, sir. And uh, we look forward to all the great stuff you and Ace are going to provide for us here at EP Sports Network. Coach, enjoy the uh, All-Star game on Saturday as well. Thank and you. that is going to wrap it up. Next week, we'll talk more about the uh, the Tony the Tiger Sample and all the other stuff going on. So for El Autobus, Christian Molina, the Hall of Fame coach Tony Grijalva I'm Mondo the Marshall Medina thanks so much for joining us on another edition of the series